it's gonna do, so. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell our audience just in the most simplest terms, what does Lolly do? So Lolly is a Bitcoin rewards company. Uh, we give people free Bitcoin back when they shop at over a thousand different merchants. So there are definitely some big brands on your platform like mm -hmm. Nike, eBay, and Microsoft. How many retailers do you support right now and how many do you hope to support in the future? So right now we just hit over 1,100 merchants um, on the platform and uh, ideally we'd like to be in the tens of thousands. Um, we just uh, launched a new app that actually gives people the ability to earn in-store. So there's just like so many stores, uh, like mom and pop shops that we can you know, tap into for people to earn on their everyday purchases uh, when they go into their favorite restaurants, gas stations, coffee shops, everything. And so how does it work? How do you actually earn when you're walking around a shop and paying for things? Yeah, so we have our, our Chrome extension uh, that we've we've had for the last like three and a half years. And uh, that actually, you know, you just earn on, on everyday purchases, on online purchases. And with uh, in-store, the uh, app that we just launched, you can actually turn any credit or debit card into a Bitcoin rewards uh, card. So you go into the app, uh, iOS or Android, you hook up your card, uh, credit or debit card, and you can just start earning um, when you go to um, coffee, your favorite coffee shops, uh, restaurants, fast food, uh, gas stations, and pretty much anything. It's pretty cool. It yeah. seems like it's going to be one of the ways that will help bring Bitcoin to more people because, yes. you know, you're at an event, you're an event like this, there's mm -hmm. 20,000 people, and you make, it makes you think that everyone knows about Bitcoin, but in reality, that's not the case, is it? It's yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we're just trying to make uh, Bitcoin more accessible and reduce the friction. So a lot of people already have a credit card that they know and love, and we're trying to say you don't need a new you know, credit card. You can have your existing card. You can just turn it into a Bitcoin card. And so what are one of the things you think are stumbling blocks for future Bitcoin adoption? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's still like an education curve with Bitcoin. I think because it's volatile, people question, you know, is it investment? Is it payments? You know, what, what, how can they make it a part of their everyday life? And people are not paying with Bitcoin. So, we, you know, we have to have some sort of use case for it because when you just use it as a store of value, it kind of just sits there. It's not as active of an experience. People aren't checking it every day. With, with uh, rewards, I think you, it actually turns into a way more active experience. And if you give people the actual ability to make Bitcoin a part of their everyday life, uh, it becomes a way better tool for people and they think about it more and they question their money um, and they start to learn about the sound money uh, principles that make Bitcoin so powerful. There are definitely some retailers out there that would be more hesitant to accept Bitcoin because of the environmental impact. How do you convince retailers to use Lolly, even with that sort of um, discussion going on in the background all the times right now. Yeah, so we actually haven't had an issue with that. I think um, there's a lot of FUD, uh, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt around Bitcoin being this like energy inefficient currency. But uh, one thing, when, when the few retailers that actually like bring that up, what we say is like, well, do you know the economic, you know, or the 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 uh, environmental impact of fiat currency, of having all these banks, having all these uh, titanium cards in your wallet. Uh, there's horrible inefficiencies with the existing financial institution, but because it was the only thing that existed, no one even questioned the, the uh, environmental impact of having all of that infrastructure in place. Um, so the cool thing about Bitcoin and, and energy is that it actually takes energy and turns it into money. It, it adds an incentive to uh, actually have renewables uh, power uh, Bitcoin mining. So um, we've actually seen, you know, since Bitcoin started, um, a lot more um, uh, renewables actually powering. So solar, wind, uh, actually powering um, uh, Bitcoin mining facilities. And then additionally, um, it's also brought to light how much waste uh, uh, these these uh, energy facilities have. And so Bitcoin can take the and almost serve as like an energy or a money battery is the best way of looking at it, where. If, if there's just wasted energy at a mining facility or at a uh, power plant, you can actually put that that remaining energy that would have just gone into the ether, put it directly into a proof of work um, uh, protocol like Bitcoin, and actually get money out of it and turn it right into into money. I'm joined now by Shahar Bialik. He's the CEO and co-founder of Curve. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, nice to meet you. Can you tell us what Curve does? 
So, of course. So Curve is an operating system for money. The purpose of existence of Curve is to bring the customer back in control and enabling them to free their money. Uh, in more specific terms, it means that our job is to bring the entire financial ecosystem, both the traditional finance ecosystem and the emerging DeFi ecosystem, into one space, one operating system from which the customer can be access and control their money in a much more fungible way and with more convenience and control. What it means in layman terms is that as a customer, I can download the Curve app, I can load all my cards, connect all my accounts, DeFi and traditional finance, and I only have one card mm -hmm. with one PIN, and I'm enjoying now the entire world of money without the need to choose. No longer need to choose between do I want to use my bank card X or bank card Y or wallet X with Bitcoin or wallet Y with Ethereum, I can now bring all of them into one place and enjoy both worlds. I can keep earning rewards from my underlying cards and get more rewards from Curve. I can go back in time and move transaction between my wallet to my account with a tap. Um, and that provides the customer much more control and convenience of their life, similar to what Spotify did with peer-to-peer -peer music or Amazon did with commerce. Mm -hmm. Customer is back in control and one card to rule them all. And you've literally just been on the Nakamoto stage, you're fresh off, and you came uh, and announced a big new announcement that you are unveiling a crypto rewards program. And you say this turns any card into a card where you can get earn Bitcoin effectively. So how does it work? Absolutely. So in order for us to bring the ecosystem into one place, to be able to converge both the ecosystem into one place, we had to build a completely whole new layer that aggregates the entire ecosystem. Now in DeFi, that is pretty simple because DeFi is by definition an immutable open peer-to-peer -peer system. But traditional finance by definition is an extremely controlled walled garden. And in order for us to, to access, uh, we had to fight really hard for five years and gain unique access that enables us to build a whole new layer, a layer three we call it, on top of the entire ecosystem. When you build a lower layer three and over the top layer of the entire ecosystem, that means they can keep using your cards, but now you're getting all the benefits supercharged by the layer three ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, it means you can earn rewards on an underlying card, but now you can earn rewards from Curve. And because we are a, a regulated entity, we already must verify our customers in this way or another, that means we can on-ramp them and off-ramp them into the Bitcoin ecosystem with a tap. We already verify the customer, which means we can now enable customers to earn Bitcoin rewards from Curve. Mm -hmm. So if you have a Bitcoin rewards card already or a Bitcoin wallet, you can keep earning rewards from that card, from that product. But on top of that, you get more rewards from Curve, double dip. So can you tell us about the types of rewards people can expect to get? What percentage of cashback would they receive? For so in, in the US and also in the UK, people can get up to 1% cashback for their everyday spend. So a customer, for example, will have a Chase card, can keep using their Chase card anywhere they want and earn 1% cashback rewards as they do, or 2%, 2x rewards on the restaurant. But on top of that, they also get another 1% cashback from Curve. They can choose to use fiat currency, but as we know, fiat currency has inflation, regression tax, will eventually uh, reduce in value, or Bitcoin rewards or Satoshis, uh, which means they are not on risk. They don't have to go and sign up to a new product that is intimidating from the DeFi world, yet enjoying both worlds in one place. Mm -hmm. And he said during your speech on the Nakamoto stage that many customers are afraid of Bitcoin and it needs to be made more accessible to the masses. Now, Bitcoin's been around for 13 years now. What does the industry need to do to reach more people? What are they doing wrong right now? What happens is that the industry started with a very close community. People, most of the, the market did not believe that Bitcoin will get where it is today. And we proved them differently. We proved them otherwise. And it was a fight for us. It was a close community. And we are still very tight, tiny community. We are still across the globe about 120, 130 million people who are in this uh, uh, DeFi world, the Bitcoin standard, and enjoying what we've discovered as the new reality. But the world is in billions. For Bitcoin to be successful, we need to be able to achieve more than a billion people adopting that. Mm -hmm. And how the question that came about, what can we do to bring the billion people, the masses, into Bitcoin? And we have to do it fast. Uh, Satoshi uh, account that came back online, if it is indeed his account, he called to action to be able to spend more money and more resources, more of our time to go faster 
And why? Because in every market evolution, there's always the competition between the incumbent achieving innovation versus the disruptor, we achieving mass adoption. And if we will not achieve mass adoption fast enough, the incumbents will take the Bitcoin standard, make it their own, and will lose all the centralization and immutable peer-to-peer -peer monetary system we're trying to build to replace the existing system. So when you look at that from that uh, dimension, then the question came about what can lure the masses in the least intimidating way possible, in a way that they have no risk in terms of getting the Bitcoin. They don't have to spend their own money, if you'd like, to gain a Bitcoin. And for us, especially in the US where the market is um, adoring rewards for their spend, there's nothing better than just, instead of getting 1% fiat cash back, take Bitcoin cash back or Satoshis, mm -hmm. because then you can appreciate the currency and you slowly enter to this new world that we have discovered many, many years ago. And a common phrase that we're seeing on crypto Twitter and here at Bitcoin 2022, you used it in your speech, orange, orange pilling. pilling. Yes. Orange pilling the next now, billion. That's the goal. That's the mission. I've got to ask you, is the phrase orange pilling a bit cultish? Do you think that some people who aren't into Bitcoin will hear this and it will put them off a bit? I, I, I don't think so. I think it's an internal terminology and it's fine. Like in, in my company, with my team, we have our own terminology of what we're doing. For example, we talk together about what we're really doing because the community we, we, we are addressing right now are experts in what we do. They understand the financial ecosystem really, really well because otherwise we couldn't have changed it. Mm -hmm. So I think internally it's okay to call ourselves an operating system for money. But when you go outside to the market, orange pinning most people will not understand it's okay to use it internally and that's the right audience to use orange pinning we know exactly what we're trying to do we know how we let them taste and get out of their long-term sleep into the new world but when we go outside the market we're not coming to them hey come to us because we'll get you into the DeFi world no we have to hijack existing systems existing terminology to bring them into us so can you tell us a bit more about your views on fiat currencies and the potential of central bank digital currencies? Because of course, with the way your business operates and the way that you allow people to add cards, it is a big part of your business. We, we started from traditional finance for a reason, because we know that there, there are some elements of the regulation that are necessary. And I've talked about it on the stage. Uh, there is a true problem that does threaten the fabric of society, which is criminal activity and funding of terrorism. It's something that none of us would agree we need to have. All of us would agree we don't want to have in society. But the challenge in society right now with the existing financial ecosystem is that it lacks accountability. It is out of control. And what I mean by that specifically is that notion of inflation. We've accrued over $200 trillion in debt in the U.S. alone, which is insane. And what happens in every administration, they're pushing out to the next administration. But what does it mean? It's not like the administration we're pushing it. It's for our children and our grandchildren that have to repay this debt. And it's not sustainable. And we've seen it in Latin America. We've seen it in Mexico. We've seen it in Argentina. We even saw it in Japan. So the problem we have with the current ecosystem is that it lacks accountability by the administration. And we can no longer count on them to have accountability. And we have to change that with a mutable peer-to-peer -peer format, the Bitcoin standard. Now, there are still challenges on how to achieve that. And I don't think anyone still have the solution. Because, as I said, we still must ensure that we verify customers that they do not are handling terrorism and money laundering. At the same time, and I mentioned it also on the talk, that we still want to bring the customer at the center and decentralize the identity. So the real challenge to be, bring Bitcoin to the masses and achieve that is really how can we ensure we're meeting regulatory requirements with regards to AML, money laundering, and yet give the identity back to the customer and the customers back in control. Now, I mentioned earlier that the challenge that we face, that why there is a race right now, is because our job is to go faster to the masses before the incumbents will get tech innovation. What I meant by that is exactly the question you asked about CDBC. If the central banks will take Bitcoin standard and will inject it into the ecosystem, the only thing they've done, they've changed a manual paper ledger to a digital ledger. But if they won't do it right, they would lose all the centralization and we'll still have the monetary control that creates inflation. And that we cannot allow. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way that the regulator can still maintain their objective of building a society and economy, still 
the allowing us to be much more accountable on our society is created. And I think that's the challenge, and I think the challenge lies on the identity. The moment we're able to decentralize identity, yet still verify that, we have achieved the outcome. Plus, of course, the masses. So, as we've established, Curve is an app where you can add all of your credit and debit cards. And there's one really surreal feature which you touched upon at the start of the interview, where you can effectively go back in time and move a transaction that you've got on one card and put it on another card, which is surreal. My question to you, though, is, with really, really clever features like this, aren't you just making fiat look good and making it less of an incentive to move to crypto? On the contrary, because what really are we doing with the go back in time? We're sitting over at the top of the entire financial ecosystem, TradFi and DeFi. And when you go back in time, you basically make everyone else fungible. It's no longer world gardens. I made a transaction with my card X. I want to move it to my Bitcoin wallet. I can go back in time and move it to Bitcoin because it makes more sense now. It appreciates in value. Why not? Why wouldn't I? And that, that, that is the point of go back in time. It puts you back in control. It allows you to change your mind after you made a transaction. Whereas today's ecosystem puts pressure on you, choose the card before you make the transaction, and you're done. How There's long, nothing you can do that. How do people have to go back in time? So you can go back in time up to 30 days later, <laughs> okay. but we just introduced a feature that allows you to split any of your transaction into installments. So again, making money fungible. You made a transaction with your Bitcoin, you made a transaction with your fiat account. You can go back in time up to a year ago, and split into installments. If you'd like, be in PL anywhere you want, any merchant, online or offline. Again, it's something you can do uniquely because we're sitting on top of everyone else so we can supercharge your entire financial ecosystem with the best of both worlds. Now, I was talking to MasterCard yesterday. They're getting heavily involved in crypto, as is Visa. What do you think about these legacy payment networks getting involved in crypto? Do you think it's a good thing? Anyone who's getting involved in crypto and DeFi is a good thing because it's more resources, more minds coming and thinking about it. And those minds eventually may leave Visa and MasterCard and build their own startups and join the community. So it is not bad. The challenge we see here, and I'm not sure if the challenge is the MasterCard and Visa of the world, it might be the banks of the world, but the challenge we see, I repeat again, we have to go fast before they achieve innovation because their customers are the banks mm -hmm. and they their interests are not directly aligned with the customer because we who use Visa MasterCard are not their customers. So we have to be very careful on how we approach the next five, ten years and I trust this community to be able to do that. And of course there are a number of platforms now that are offering Bitcoin rewards or Sats back, I think it's been called Sats by some. back. What separates Curve from other competitors in this space? You don't have to choose. They're great. Keep using them. Add them to Curve and double dip the rewards. Fantastic. Well, Shahar Bialik, it's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you Thank very you for much. Your time. Thank you for your time as well. Thank you. Bitcoin Market Cap, as you know, and we're here with Scott Melker at Bitcoin 2022. The end of the second day. How are you feeling? For me, it's the end of the third day because <laughs> I was here at Industry Day and I'm, I'm really tired, to be quite honest, but uh, it's the best kind of tired. <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, what has been the best thing you've seen so far from Industry Day, I guess, all three days up until now? I mean, to be, to be quite frank, it's just the sheer scale of the entire thing. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot of speeches that stuck out, but the, that's not really the narrative at, at this point. It's that you walk around this place and feel like you've walked into JFK at an airport terminal and it's as crowded as the day before Christmas. Do you right? think that there were actually 40,000 people here, like people were saying? I would not be surprised if that was true. I mean, we have a, we're, we're prone to hyperbole <laughs> and slight yeah. exaggeration, so I have no idea, but it's absolutely massive. To the, fact, to the point where our scheduling was too close when we didn't realize we had to walk 20 minutes to get somewhere for the <laughs> next thing, as I'm sure that you're sympathetic for. Yes, so, um, you know, we did this last year, and it wasn't even a year ago, right? It was 10 months, because yeah. it was in June, and we were shocked that they fit 14,000 people into a 10,000 person venue. And it feels like now there's no venue big enough to scale <laughs> how many people will buy tickets to come to something like this. I think seeing the continued sort of, even if it's small nation state adoption, I think we're just still traveling along the very obvious road to 
all of the different levels of adoption that we talk about. Like it's not just getting more people to sign up, now it's getting more countries to sign up and more companies to sign up and more, yeah. right? So it, it's happening at every single level, billionaire down, institution, country down. And it's just astounding to see because we talked about it for so long and we were the crazy people. Not so crazy anymore. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was thinking when I was walking the 30 minutes I need to walk to get from any hall to the next was, I didn't see that many familiar faces and I'm curious, although I guess you've been here, are the people here new to Bitcoin and they're being sort of converted by this or is the is this event aimed kind of like preaching to the choir? Are the people here already, you know? That's a really good question. I think it's a lot of both, but we need it to be less of the latter, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. I mean, Gemini just put out their report that basically said 15 to 20 percent of all Americans now hold crypto. That's higher than before, I right? think. Right? Yeah. But that 45 percent of them bought that for the first time in 2021. So basically, half, almost half the people in the United States who have crypto first bought it last year. So you have to believe that that's part of the growth here. That those people went down the rabbit hole. But you come to conventions like this, and it starts to feel like a little bit of an old boys club where it's the same people saying the same thing to each other, right? Maybe that's because in this case, it's really Bitcoin only. It, yes, right? it's and, and very you can, much Bitcoin And, and only. that's not a criticism, it's just a fact that there's only so many things you can say for four days about the same asset. Yes, we get it. Nation state adoption, institutional adoption, freedom, all really important, <laughs> but they were all important last year yes. too. And the year before. Right? So I do before. think, and I'm not talking about assets, I just think we need to still work on the, the messaging and how we talk to people that don't get it at all. Making sure well, we don't talk down to them, making sure that we have a, it's like almost we like need a better PR agent or something who can just explain it to them in two minutes and, and get them on board. Well, people are using the phrase here, which I hadn't heard before, was like um, orange pilling it for yeah. people. Yeah. I feel like that's great for, like you said, the, the inner club. But if I didn't know about crypto, I wouldn't want to swallow the orange pill. It sounds almost like a bad thing. I think we do need sort of more of a, a better mm -hmm. PR term. Yeah, I mean, orange pilling super cool. And it, <laughs> and it works definitely when you're talking about like Michael Saylor talks to some other billionaire yeah. who is super dismissive and Saylor orange pills this guy. Yeah. Right. But listen, it's a, it's a matrix reference. Mm -hmm. No, yes, right? of course. And when you take the pill in the matrix, yes, you're aware and that's wonderful, but the world you go to really sucks. It's horrible. You understand, there's, you're underground, there's nuclear holocaust. And so like, I, I'm not saying that's what the reference, <laughs> but for some people, that may be sort of the image that you invoke is that you're yeah, now that's what like I'm being, thinking of, like, right? And so, I like to take the positive sort of view of everything. It's cool, it's just saying you're converting them, you're getting them in, but then I guess maybe to someone who isn't in the bubble, it feels like you're trying to like uh, convert them to a new religion or something. Yeah, well there's, there, there just is a lot of slang in a way of talking about Bitcoin and crypto that I think does, it's like self-fulfilling uh, and everyone thinks this will happen and it just goes on in the bubble. But what I like about the announcements today, like you said, um, what Jack said, is that it is bringing the traditional financial stuff into crypto because the future of adoption might be no one even knows they're using crypto, but all of the apps are just built on it. That you know? has to be the future of adoption. Yeah. It has to. The only way that this works is if everybody who doesn't care about the tech is just using it because it's better like your phone like the internet like email i don't care how my phone works i just i'm happy that it makes a phone call and i can text message someone i certainly don't know the ins and outs of a search engine i'm just glad that i can find the information i'm looking yeah. for assuming that it's not fake um <laughs> but that i mean that's the future and i think that talk about one of the things that's more inspiring about being here that notable I really think we're getting to the point where the companies are starting to build products or have ideas that might be that seamless for grandma, right? Where she doesn't think about it, she just does stuff and it's, it's blockchain native. Yeah, interesting. We'll see, I mean, one of my jobs as, like a, as a cryptocurrency educator is to try to come up with ways to tell people what something is. And like you said, I, I still don't think there is that like two minute guide anywhere out there, even though I've published like a lot of them, but there's still, there isn't that one. I'm curious if after this event, something like that will come up in the future. That's a blessing and a curse, right? Because the curse being that people lose interest and they're good for like one tweet or a TikTok video's worth of attention span before yeah. they completely give up on anything. Now, that's the curse. But the blessing is that 
the asset's so important that there's a lot of things you want to tell people about, right? A year ago, we weren't, listen, we, we've been talking about censorship resistance and these things for years, but it was like in these distant places, we weren't talking about it in Canada yeah. and Russia and Ukraine and the way that it's being used in the war by people on both sides to improve their lives. And so it feels like the world is helping do the messaging for us pretty obvious, right? You're seeing all the things that we were called crazy for talking about for, for years, but we still need the elevator pitch, the really fast one. And, and I, we haven't gotten there yet. I don't think it's a problem, but we need it. So the last question will be a super general one that we'll ask you all the time. What do you think is going to happen with Bitcoin in 2022? In the future? This year? I, yeah. I, I Listen, I'm an eternal optimist, and I believe that markets always go up. There's nothing I hate more than a price prediction that's going to make me look like an idiot. <laughs> uh, and so I will, I will refrain from that. Actually, I won't. I'd be surprised. <laughs> I'd be surprised if by this year we're not seeing much higher prices above the previous all-time high. I'd be pretty surprised if we weren't at $100,000 this year, which I don't think is that ambitious of a target. Um, the only thing that could prevent it is full global meltdown, where it's just you know, hor on, it's hor horrible possible. for everywhere. Yeah, so I think that uh, we have to be you know, cognizant. But I think that if something like that happens, much like in 2020, you buy the dip on Bitcoin because March 2020, Bitcoin went below $4,000 and went to 69000 mm -hmm. while the stock market doubled and everybody partied like it was 1999 because their stocks had doubled. If you guys looked over here, the thing to buy is the one that's going to go parabolic when things correct. So I think even if, if we see a terrible global situation, Bitcoin will be the asset to buy if it goes down. But otherwise, I think it's unstoppable.